Well, um, Pam asked me to talk about the th about the same topic that I talked about at the roundtable that we did together. Uh, it was sponsored by the AUA, wasn't it, Pam? And it was yes. a group of advocacy groups that came together. And at that time, I was representing the Society of Women and the Society of Women's Health Research. So I'll just tell you about some of my disclosures over the last 12 months. Um, I do some legal consultation. I'm an uh, editor for, or a, a contributor for something called Up to Date, and I have uh, numerous um, NIH studies. And this year, I'm the American Urogynecological Vice President moving to President-elect. Well, the Society of Women's Health Research, their work started in 2015. There were two really interesting things happening at the, at the level of the NIH and um, are one thing, and the Society of Women's Health Research was trying to tap into it. Uh, what people were recognizing is, if you think back on the healthy heart about 20 years ago, at that time, our understanding of cardiac disease and heart attacks was all based on people who'd had them. In fact, there was a think tank that was going on in Washington, D.C., probably now 30 years ago. And at that time when they met, the belief of a high blood pressure was 190 over 90. Can you imagine that? I mean, now we just know that that's absurd. Um, it took the work of a group of um, different researchers, epidemiologists, people who were social scientists, who decided that they would start trying to study the healthy heart um, and then started a longitudinal study where they took people who had various degrees of cardiac health and followed them for decades. And during that time, uh, they, uh, they did questionnaires and they got, you know, blood markers. And from that, they were, start, they were able to see as some people fell off in terms of having cardiac disease, what were their risk and protective factors. That belief of how you can start to try to understand prevention was what motivated the NIH to try to do the same work around bladder health. That work's really being led by Tamara Bavendam, a great, a great woman urologist who left urology, went into industry, and then joined the NIH. And she's been the program director for nine years, and this was one of her passions. So while that work was brewing, the Society of Women's Health Research pulled together a separate group of people. Some, some of us were investigators in that consortium, some of us weren't. And they tried to have us start writing some white papers that would be much faster than the work that would come out of this network. For example, I mean, we're in year six now of this network and we have some studies, but we haven't done a whole lot of work yet. We're about to start. And so um, sometimes if you can get a group of people together who are thought leaders, they can just write opinion pieces. And that's where this work started. So in that, in, that, um, in that mission statement of when we first met, it was just to kind of review current information and identify knowledge gaps and start trying to make recommendations, uh, not only to researchers, but also to Congress about how we can inform research policy and education. Um, try to raise awareness through among agencies, like talking to people like you, um, patient advocacy groups and medical societies and then promote education among healthcare providers. Well, one of the things is, uh, one of the women who sat on the board with me on that group was Claire Close. I don't know if you guys know her, but she's a pediatric urologist who worked in Chicago and also has her own private practice in Las Vegas. And she had a deep belief and kept advocating for it. And so did many of the urologists at the table that really we should be working with school nurses. That when we think about it on the front lines of toileting behaviors and education, that they're very, there's very little that um, teachers themselves know. And we started being very interested in what do school nurses know? For example, in the hospital, we know that the nurses that work with physicians in the office are credible. But when you go out into the community, who's really working with, at the schools? And our belief was it was the school nurses. So we try to come up with a clever way that we could interact with school nurses. You just can't go and call one school nurse at a school and talk to her. You're not gonna get enough opinions. So Claire and I said we would do this kind of bogus literature review and we would submit it to the, society, the National Society of School Nurses meeting. And then when we got to the meeting, we were gonna stand by our poster and talk to people. And that was really the purpose of this research, was to try to start talking to a bunch of school nurses about what was going on. So um, we submitted this abstract. We just called it Raising Awareness. Um, and I can't even, I can't see the title. You guys can, but I can't see it because of the stuff at the top of my screen. 
Hold on, I want to go back. Um, let me go. And what we did was we just sat at this poster and some people walked up and, you know, we just talked to them about, you know, um, we wanted to let them know that we thought there were problems with school children. We cite some literature, but all of this was meaningless to us. What we really did was talk. So usually what would happen is one of us would talk and there'd be a group of people who would come. And, you know, there's something about talking about bowel movements and urination that draws a crowd. So usually we had like six or seven nurses who were there with us telling stories. One of us would take notes. Uh, we had a recorder and the other one of us would prompt the discussion. So we kind of moved through this very fluid. Um, we had over, we talked over two days, we talked over a hundred, what we called in the trenches school nurses. So we really didn't ask a lot of questions of people who were school administrators are people who were far away. We really just wanted our conversation to be with nurses who were actually in schools. And we talked to women from the Midwest, the East Coast, men and women, but mostly women, Texas, uh, Canada, Montana, inner city, suburban and rural schools. And what happened is, is that the, that evening after we had talked for two days, Claire and I sat down and pulled out all of our quotes that we had from people and decided that we would categorize what we heard into eight categories of concern. And we tried to capture the language exactly that were used by school nurses. And one thing we also wanted to do was um, really try to get, at, get some willingness for the National Association of School Nurses leadership to work with us. Uh, we wanted to, we knew that at the end game, and I'll show those results to you today, we wanted to do a survey with the school nurses to try to see what was going on with them, but we needed someone to help us get the survey out. And you can't just do that um, easily. You have to get uh, permission from the association. So the eight, eight categories of talking points that we really got from uh, the school nurses were first bathroom accessibility, uh, bathroom privacy, the safety of bathrooms, uh, nurses' knowledge and their lack of knowledge, uh, what were competing priorities and how people saw toileting kind of fitting into their competing priorities, uh, what kinds of things nurses that were already doing about bowel and bladder health, uh, that there were so many nutrition and diet challenges, and also talking just clearly about hydration. So what I tried to do here was put some quotes that we heard from nurses um, and what summarized for us some of the experiences that people were having. So uh, one of the nurses told us about two girls who were sent home to school um, because they were found outside peeing because there was no time to go to the bathroom before class. Um, in response to a typical teacher complaint of children leaving the classroom when they don't need to, one nurse said, well, maybe they need to just get up and move more, that there's something really wrong about the way we do our schools where kids just have to sit for a long time. Um, a nurse whose high school had been converted to an elementary school, uh, they made no bathroom changes. So there were still only two to three stalls versus seven to eight, which is typical for elementary school. So that's really a disaster. If anybody who works in, in um, primary education knows, you can't round up that many kids um, and get them through the bathroom in two to three stalls. Um, a pregnant teacher came to the school nurse and one of the nurses reported this and begged her to come into the room and let her have bathroom breaks because she was leaking between the bathroom breaks she could have and one of the things that really became clear to us in talking with school nurses was there is a culture where teachers are subjected to the same restrictions that the students are, and it's not helping the teachers either. And it's also making them a little less compassionate about dealing with these kids, these things with kids. Um, we had heard many stories about how unsafe bathrooms are. And you have to remember that this really is five years ago. I can only imagine it's gotten worse. Um, kids go to the bathroom and a lot happens. There were examples that we heard um, over and over of the bullying, uh, kids cutting themselves or being cut. Uh, there were locations for suicide attempts. Uh, one nurse reported there was a birth of a baby left in a bathroom. Uh, the shooters hide their guns um, up in the top of the ceiling, especially the ceilings with acoustic tiles, that there's a lot of stuff that's hidden there. Um, some kids hide their box cutters that they use on other kids in the air ducts. Now, most of these examples came from Philadelphia. I don't know, you know, sometimes when a conversation would start and there were a group of nurses there who knew each other, 
then it would really get wild. Um, I wouldn't say that they, we heard this from everyone, but just even hearing it once from urban schools was uh, frightening to both Claire and I. Um, one of the things that we really learned after talking with people is, you know how when you're at the airport and you're going into a bathroom, it really is a maze. You know, you go, there's no doors. You go in through and there's usually, you start to go into the bathroom. Maybe there's a little brick wall. You can go in in two entrances and then walk into the bathroom. And really, uh, there was so much talk about how kids don't feel safe in bathrooms where there's a door that can be closed. And I don't mean a door to the bathroom commode, to the toilet. I mean a door into the bathroom where a kid could feel trapped. And um, I've watched now in many of the schools I've gone into, and it's so bizarre, they all have doors. They aren't these mazes. And yet in public places, like in airports and um, you know, increasingly in uh, buildings, I see those mazes, but I don't see them in schools. And I think that that's a, a big mistake and something that would make a bathroom much more safe. Um, many nurses themselves had personal issues with uh, bladders. Uh, many nurses talked about their own children's experiences. In almost all cases, when their children had issues, it was the RN who identified the problem and then made sure that the child got to a pediatric urologist. Uh, several nurses shared stories of their own childhood trauma with incontinence at school after being made to hold. And one nurse stated that her adult friends still remember that event. Um, it really seemed to us, to Claire and I, that in general, nurses, school nurses seem very informed about constipation, but oddly, we're not very wise hmm. about any urinary issues. And we really felt that that might be due to the fact that kids can stay in school if they have wet underwear, but they get sent home from school if they have soiling, any kind of soiling, that there's some health restriction that means that they have to go home. And so nurses were very keen and surprising to us had a greater depth of understanding about fecal incontinence than they did urinary incontinence. And we also um, came to understand that still continence is required to start a full day in kindergarten. And that might be another reason why um, we see a different level of knowledge. Um, these, there, were t there were moments in talking with nurses and we tried not to teach. Uh, we really were there that were just so painful with the stuff that nurses said. We had this one nurse who told us that she believed she had a, she had a boy who had a problem with urinary incontinence and she felt that she solved the problem by um, telling the boy that she, would, that she had a washer or dryer at the school and that if he wet his pants one more time, he was going to have to come to her office and wash his own underwear. And then when talking with her, Claire started to say, well, maybe he just stopped drinking. Maybe you didn't do anything. You didn't cure his habit. What you did was make him afraid to come to you with this issue. Um, one RN said that she kept new underpants in her office and that she thinks some kids just wet to get the underpants. Mm -hmm. Another idea that to us was just ludicrous given our, given our understanding of how humiliating these issues are for children. They're certainly not doing them to get new underpants. Um, there are very many competing priorities for school nurses. Um, the issues around diabetes, um, or around the use of EpiPens and kids who have allergies. Uh, lice runs, its, runs rampant, really, in a lot of these schools, and the nurses are dealing with it. And also trying to deal with nutrition, especially around the area of obesity. Uh, the nurses feel like these priorities have been really hit hard and are how they're spending the majority of their time. Um, one nurse said, now that you've made me think about, you know, urination and voiding issues, I'm moving the ranking from where I put this, I'm now going to say asthma, I'm going to, um, when I think through asthma, allergies, bladder, I now believe that when I think about it on a daily basis, mm -hmm. the bladder issues really are the thing that I'm seeing most frequently. Um, some of the nurses talked about how uh, some of the nurses talked about how some teachers or they themselves um, had started talking to kids about normal pooping um, and how it doesn't have to hurt. One nurse bought squatty potties uh, for the bathrooms in the primary school, and I really felt that that was beneficial to the kids, and she recognized that link between bowel continence and urinary continence. Um, one of the other issues has been that nurses have often found that since the issues with uh, families that don't have a lot of, don't have enough money or enough food, there's often issues with health literacy and that they often had to use the child to teach the family 
um, about what was proper nutrition, what were the correct things to eat, how to take care of their bowel health, and um, that there are, she felt that there were resources that she had used that were online or games that are played that teach health lessons online. Um, one of the posters that was right next to us was a poster just talking about addressing food scarcity in Cincinnati and the, and the lack of uh, food, the lack of uh, fresh local food, and that certainly in um, urban areas where there are, is a lack of supermarkets and fresh food, that talking to families about healthy choices almost becomes ridiculous. That you know, when people step out their door and have to go find food within walking distance, it really is food scarcity. They're food deserts. Um, another RN said that the reality at her school was that kids just weren't eating. Uh, there wasn't food, even uh, there weren't healthy choices at the school. And when the kids were presented with food that was healthy, they wouldn't even um, accept it. Um, there are mandated nutrition standards for, for schools. And many of the kids who um, are getting free lunches, the food that's being served is nothing that they have ever seen before. And usually what they'll just do is leave the food on their plate and just say, this isn't the kind of food I eat. Um, and so the nurses felt that a lot of, some of the um, nutrition issues that they saw were kids were self-induced because they were so unfamiliar with the foods. And someone also said that vegetables were available to families, but the families really didn't know how to cook them. Um, there is a significant lack of hydration. I think all of us can understand that if you can only go to the bathroom at certain times of the day. Um, one of the nurses talked about how they have these rules where when you go to drink a drink of water, they count out one, two seconds, and then you're supposed to move on. So if we, you know, a lot of places, certainly when I went to school, there was no such thing as water bottles. You didn't walk around with a water bottle in your backpack. You went to the school fountain. Um, and, you know, the RNs felt that the nurses preferred, I mean, that the teachers preferred that there wasn't, that there was water scarcity because then it meant that the kids didn't ask to go to the bathroom so frequently. Um, one of the RNs kind of went around this by giving out cups of water to students during the breaks. Um, she said, it, you know, the teachers came and talked to her about it, said they didn't like it. But she felt that when she did that, there were fewer absences and fewer respiratory tract infections because the students were hydrated. Uh, one high school had passed a rule that there couldn't be any more water bottles. And this is actually true at my children's high school, John and Mia. Um, there was an incident where somebody put vodka in the water bottle, drank it all day and passed out at school, ended up in the hospital. And then the policy at the whole high school changed that they, nobody could bring any water bottles um, you know, couldn't have anything in the room um, at all, which is just really shocking, isn't it? I, um, so the next step for us at that time, uh, we were thinking that the next step, there were two things that we wanted to do. Um, one was a joint questionnaire through the National Association of School Nurses membership email, and then a time feasibility study for bathroom access. Do you know for three years now at my kids' high school, I have not been able to get anyone from the biology department, the math department, the science department. I keep telling them I'm a professor, I can get funding for this. I would like to, to um, teach your kids how to do a scientific study, um, but I need a faculty member to agree to do this with me and nobody's interested. Um, the school that I'm at in Oak Park, uh, about three years ago, let in a film team to kind of see how the school is in terms of um, diversity, you know, like Black Lives Matter and get interviews with the kids and interviews with the teacher. And then it ran nationally, it was kind of a big deal and created, it really demonstrated that there is, a, there, that there's racism inside the school. And because of that now the school is really hesitant to do any kind of interaction with anybody outside of the school and I've just been caught in that crosshairs. So if I can't even get into my kids' high school, it's just been impossible for me to get into others. And so that work still has not moved forward. But the work about the joint questionnaire did move forward, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that now. I just wanted to check my time real quick. So this is a study that, um, that Clara and I did along with um, other members of the uh, women's health research. And what we did first was we wanted to now, 
instead of just talking to the women we met at that conference, because that could, or the nurses we met at that conference, because that could really be biased, um, we thought that we would try to send out a survey to all the school nurses uh, across the country. And we wanted to describe school nurses' knowledge and experience regarding student bathrooms and access and bathroom policies in their school. We developed a survey um, that kind of hit at the high points that I was talking about before that we learned from nurses. It was distributed by the National Association of School Nurses by email to members twice over a three week period. And then we just talk about um, how we did it. We used a survey monkey and we tabulated the results using a classic statistical uh, software package. And we had uh, 488 people who clicked on the survey and 74% opened it. The people who did respond, uh, the majority of them worked four times and many of them had a, a significant amount of experience, five years of experience. The majority who responded were from grade school, 53% uh, from middle school and high school teachers. And the reason if you add up those numbers are greater than 100 is that some of the schools, you know, for example, it might be a school of one to eight. So they would have marked a grade school and middle school. And so that's why you see that number being kind of weird. Um, when we asked specific questions, we found that bathrooms were clean during the day, 53%. To me, that's even a shockingly low number. Uh, that they were free of odor only 43% of the time, which means 57% of the time they were odiferous. Um, they were well stocked with toilet paper, paper towels and soap. But interestingly, when we just asked the high school um, nurses, what, were there menstrual products? It was low, like most experience, like most of the women's experience on this call. There is never, if you can't, if you don't have a tampon or a pad, you're hosed, you're certainly not going to find it in the bathroom at a, at a high school. Um, interestingly, even though we heard all this stuff about how students are told that they can't go to the bathroom because there's a policy, when we asked the nurses to go find the policy, so tell us, what is your school's policy? 64% didn't even have a bathroom policy. It has really led us to believe that this is a bunch of baloney. Um, reasons nurses gave that the nurses told us that teachers made these bathroom restrictions because they believe that, um, that the students aren't really using the bathrooms, that the students misbehave in the bathrooms, and that there's adequate time already provided between breaks, which I can tell you in my kids' high school is a joke. It's three floors, five minutes, and when we go there for their uh, days to meet with their teacher, they give us 15 minutes between these classes because we're adults, and I still barely make it in terms of finding the room. I don't know how these kids do it in five minutes with these backpacks that weigh 20 pounds. Uh, school nurses were aware of current and prior concerns about access to bathrooms at their schools, they were very aware of it. School nurses felt there was not enough time between classes to use the bathroom for high school, middle school, and grade school. 37% of school nurses reported that teachers discussed their own need for better bathroom access, and that 20% of the, the faculty, at least as reported by the nurses, also felt that there was not adequate time to take a bathroom break in between classes. Um, bladder health, it's rare that anybody is ever talking about bladder health. Um, in, ter in terms of the school curriculum, less than one or 2% ever said that anyone mentioned bladder health even once. Um, as be a part of teacher's education, maybe 3%. And the nurses did admit though, it was something they did learn about as part of their education as a nurse. Um, but surprisingly, shouldn't it be 100%? <laughs> Um, few, nurture, few teachers receive education on bladder health and 25% of nurses working in middle and high school report that there's not enough time in between classes for students to use the bathroom. And most school nurses report there's no written bathroom use policy at their school. So this really leads us to what do we do next? And Claire's analogy was, do we push or pull? Should our strategy be to really push that is require and encourage education and new behaviors from the top channel down. What do we mean by that is going to school principals, going to policy makers and saying we need to start doing work 
um, about school and mandating it from a policy perspective, this forces the message in action, or do we try to get teachers, parents, and children to ask for this information and change by creating awareness, awareness and that can be done by advertising and social media. Um, well, one thing is if you look at the sequence of how this would go, federal government, state government, school districts, superintendents and principals, and then school nurses, teachers, coaches, parents, children, one of the really powerful models that does work is in Australia. And in Australia, school nurses are not hired by the principal. You see, in America, the school, the school nurses are hired by the principal or the superintendent. But in Australia, they are part of the public health service. And as a result, they report only for public health policy, which is wildly different. And they have a very interesting work that they've done already on toileting in schools. And they have a kit actually called the Toilet Tactics Kit. Um, well, when I was in Australia as a visiting professor four years ago, I met with uh, some of the school nurses who designed this. Very powerful, very different, very proactive. Um, and it's a complete model for us here in the US. However, how do we get that link into school nurses. You know, if you do it centrally as a policy, you, you work there and it gets distributed evenly to school nurses. Trying to go to every principal is just not very efficacious. Um, so I'll stop my talk there. Um, again, I feel like this is something you have been experiencing much more than I ever have. And I'd be interested to hear your questions or your comments. Yeah, and I think that for me, um, after hearing your presentation, uh, Dr. Mueller, at that um, AUA last fall and getting up and speaking behind you, which I will again today, I was, I was angry and I was, I was shocked. And then I was thinking, and I also felt as a parent of a child with bladder atrophy, um, that we have a long, we have a long road because these are situations that are happening with kids that have normal bladder and bowel habits for the most part, and yet we have that extra level of complexity on right. top of it. And that's where um, we at ABC have been trying to set out to say how, it, it, every year it's, it, it's a stress for families, it's a stress for all of us as we enter school to, here we go again, you know, how do we set our kids, kids up for well, success? I can't get over the fact that you can get a letter from a, um, a healthcare provider and let your dog be your, or your pet or your bearded dragon uh, be your uh, service pet on a plane as an adult and you can't get a letter from a doctor that people believe is legitimate saying that you need to go to the bathroom when you need to go. That, to me, that is just absolutely bizarre. You know, there are things we accept for adults and we're just not willing to still advocate that way for children, thinking that and they just go misbehave. And the idea is ludicrous. Yeah, it very much is. Um, so I don't know, I, I think that might be a good idea if I move into my presentation, so. would be willing to stay on. Um, for sure. Words, and before we go into the breakouts, it might help um, facilitate some more of those questions. Because like I said, um, and I'm gonna share my screen now, I'm gonna try. Um, share my screen and then show my presentation. So like I said, Dr. Mueller, we, when we did this together for us, we, we take it to that next level of um, complexity of helping um, our children with bladder extrophy um, navigate this continence, continence care in school. And as you talked about, um, did a great job of, there are a lot of problems associated with restricted access um, for our school facilities. And then you put, the, you put the, someone with a chronic condition, such as bladder extrophy on top of it, um, it just exasperates the problem. And our students um, were finding families talked about, we, did, we also did a, um, a survey and got over a hundred responses from the bladder extrophy community. And a lot of these answers really mirrored a lot of your own. That our students are avoiding using the bathrooms at school because they're dirty, uh, they lack privacy, 
um, or they're not allowed to go when they need to. And this is causing significant anxiety, which really can directly lead to the child's ability to concentrate um, uh, at their progress in school and or they um, are getting urinary tract infection, bladder stones, um, or worse. Um, a lot of kids too are limiting, like you had said, some of our kids self-limit what they eat or drink to avoid using the bathroom. So that kids with atrophy not drinking enough water can actually aggregate the problems with their bladders and bowels and lead that to dehydration and um, really hurt their kidneys um, in the short term and in the long term. And as I started doing work around this, um, you know, I go internationally, I travel every year to India and Uganda um, with the team and Emily who's on the call too goes with me. And we hear a lot and we, we go through a lot because the doctors do this fantastic job of closing the bladders in these developing countries. But yet Emily and I spend the entire week still talking to families that say, it's great, we've had this great bladder closure, the surgery's done, but our child is still wet because they've either gone through one piece of the surgery or they still need several surgeries. Like here in the United States, our kids could, you know, for the pads or the pull-ups, well, in, in these developing countries, they don't have um, the, the means to even have diapers. And so they're sent home and not even going to school. Now, I naively thought this was only happening in other countries until I heard your presentation and did further research. And I don't know if many of you know, but, and I, I hesitated to share this, but I think it needs to be, I think it needs to be shown that even amongst our community, and in our schools in the United States, really bad things are happening to our community. I mean, here's a little boy who was eight years old who was failed by his parents because he had atrophy. He was abused at home. He was sent to school in wet clothes. He was sent to school in girls' clothes because his parents said he would not learn how to become potty trained. The, the school system, um, failed him because he would report it to the school nurse and they ignored it. Um, even the medical, he had actually had a, a, an extra fee surgery months um, prior to him become, be, becoming missing. And this little boy was failed all along the way because of his continence issue, because of his medical problem. And long story short, I mean, his, his father ended up murdering him. And um, he went. He was missing for months, and now his dad's on trial for uh, first-degree murder because of a very sad situation that this little boy couldn't control. And that, to me, is heartbreaking. And you know, that, these are the stories that keep me up at night and want to make me help advocate for change in our schools. Um, and again, not just for our community with black atrophy, but for all kids and all families this should never happen. So I think when we are talking with the school nurses and working, um, thinking about how we're gonna go about trying to advocate for our kids, giving them a brief and just a high level over what is bladder extrophy. Um, I know the letter from a doctor, but just in simple terms that it's a rare birth defect, it, it, it affects one in 50,000 children a year. That's, that is around 100 kids in the U.S. per year. It's not a lot, so they're not going to see it a lot. It is going to be probably the one and only time our school nurses um, are working with a family with a child with bladder extrophy. But to perhaps explain to them um, that because the bladder and the urethra are not closed, the bladder cannot store urine. It is not a matter of I can hold this, or I can wait 15 minutes, or I can go during break. It's a medical issue where the bladder cannot, the urine cannot be stored. That there, and I think just really making that clear might open their eyes to that. And then when we look at, we just heard, you know, what all issues that children face, and then you you add what our issues with children with bladder atrophy face. And I'm sure when we go into the breakout rooms, we'll, we'll hear more. But, you know, there, th these seem to be the common themes. 
they need to, our children need to use the bathroom more frequently. No matter, I mean, all of our children are in different um, phases of the bladder extrophy um, surgical journey that they all take. Some may be continent by the time they start school. Some may be told that they need to use the bathroom once an hour, once every two hours. Some may need to be able to go every three hours, some four. Some need to cath every two hours. But the fact is, is they, they need to use the bathroom more frequently. Most of our kids at some point in their extrophy journey are wearing diapers or pull-ups or pads. And this isn't just in preschool or elementary school. This is in middle school. This is in high school. It, it, it could be throughout their entire school experience. So they have to face that. Um, chances are they're going, they're going to be accidents. So I'm sure there's a lot of anxiety with our kids. You know, in my, I don't want to have an accident in school. And then there's the smell, the odors that we talk about. And um, you know, I'll speak for myself. Um, I think we live around it so much, our kids with extrophy, that sometimes we're, we're immune to the smell and our children are immune to the smell, but sometimes their friends are not. And it's just something that I think our kids are very sensitive about. Um, and then the surgical scars. Um, our kids have had multiple surgeries and they're on the playground or they're, or they're changing in the, in, in, out for gym. Um, they're having to explain surgical scars. And then as they get into the middle and high school years, changing out, you know, for, for gym, um, the genitalia insecurity that they face um, in the locker rooms. So it's just a lot for kids to have to deal with just on top of um, their, their daily school. You know, how would you magnified at school? Um, lots of questions from classmates, a lot of missed class time, again, um, or um, they have to balance, or parents have to balance. Are, are we gonna miss, is my child gonna miss class? Or are they gonna miss recess? Is it always fair to take them out of recess to use the bathroom? Um, and again, the lack of privacy for boys, um, which was brought to my attention last year. And I, I, I guess I never thought about it because I have a daughter with bladder extrophy. But if boys don't even, if maybe there's only one stall with a door and the rest are urinals, how does a, how does a young boy with bladder extrophy go in and, and do his catheter in privacy? So these are just issues that really haven't been thought through. And um, especially at the schools, but us for parents, these are the things that keep us up at night all the time. Um, caffeine takes a long time and requires supplies, and that's always, always something that we're trying to navigate. Um, how do you spend 5, 10, 15 minutes caffeine, and where do we keep the supplies? And then where do we store them and the change of clothes um, if there are accidents that happen? Think our kids think about this a lot. I know they think about it every day. And these issues lead to implications. Um, I know we hear, and it's and it shouldn't be here in the United States, but I see it on on our Facebooks, and we get questions all the time. Our preschool doesn't allow our child to not start school because they're not potty trained. Well, that's not fair for our kids because it's a medical issue. So how do we work around that? We have to have a plan to work around that. Um, the UTIs and bladder stones and kidney um, damage that happens um, when kids don't toilet. Again, I could share a personal story. Um, my daughter Anna, two years ago, um, unbeknownst to me, um, she stopped cathing at school. She'd cath in the morning and she would cath when she came home. And um, she got a really bad UTI and she was in the hospital for several days on, a, on, an, on an IV. Um, antibiotic. And here she hears me talk about this every day, and yet she's, you know, behind my back, hiding the fact that she's not doing her cath at school because she didn't want to answer the questions or have to step out of the classroom. So the implications are real. You know, the missed school for surgeries. I know many of you um, students, older students on the call, I'm sure, you know, you count your surgeries on more than two hands, and it's a lot of missed school. Um, how do you make up for that? Um, the bullying and the teasing and even the family abuse um, leads to self-esteem, low self-esteem, which again could move on to substance abuse, depression, and suicide. And now this all sounds very sad and, and you know, and down, but 
you know, how can we as a community pull together and turn this into a positive, like, like they've done um, through their work in Australia. And I think we together as a community, I, we do a good job um, as parents um, working with our support groups, but how can we pull together even more and, and set our children uh, for success? And how can ABC set you parents up for success so our children can be set up for success? And I think uh, the first place to start always is to plan in advance and visit the school with your child. And I learned the hard way too, just because we visited the school once in first grade, it doesn't mean that we skip second, third, and fourth. Plan and visit your school every single year with your child before school starts and put the plan in place. Meet the school nurse, meet the, with the teachers, figure out where they're gonna keep their supplies. Just do a walkthrough so your child feels comfortable. If you don't have a 5014 accommodation plan, develop a, uh, develop a plan. Uh, a lot of times these are done with your local, your school districts. I know everyone, every school is different state. I have looked at dozens of them, but um, Emily and, and I are working with Diane Price to put together a template so we will at least have something to share with our community as a, as a starting place to make sure that um, we have everything set that we can hand our schools so that our children's accommodations will be met. Um, it, the latex issues, you know, a lot of our kids have latex allergies. So make sure before school starts um, that you checked out the classroom, you've checked out the bathroom where your child's gonna be and make sure that if they need supplies if, or if the teachers need supplies, helping your child um, with their toileting to make sure that they have latex free materials. Thing that's been really helpful for us is to set up alarms. Um, if your school allows your your kids to wear an Apple Watch, it's great to set those alarms that are very subtle. They vibrate, or ask your teacher to set them up um, on their iPad and and gently and discreetly remind the student that it's time to go to the bathroom. Um, I know. I think this is talked about at youth rally too. How do our kids carry and dispose of their catheter supplies? And I'd, and I'd love to hear, um, I'd love to get ideas from all of you because uh, my, I have a, fifth, a daughter who's 15 who still refuses to carry a purse. <laughs> so how does she discreetly carry her catheter supplies? You know, kids have to get creative. Um, do they have them in several places? Do they, are they in their locker? Are they at the teacher's desk? Um, but find a way that feels comfortable for them and then carry out that plan. And we heard a lot about hygiene lately <laughs> with all the COVID. Our kids have always needed to maintain proper hygiene. And I think it's always a good time at the beginning of the school year again to discuss the proper hygiene with your child and their teacher and to make sure that there's soap in the bathroom where your child's going to be um, using their bathroom or, or using their catheters. Making sure that there's a garbage can for them to, to dispose of their catheters um, their pull-ups or their other um, continent supplies. Um, we've set up a box in my daughter's bathroom where she has her own little lock so she can keep it private and so people can't get into it. But proper hygiene is a must for our kids so we keep their UTIs down. So that again um, would be beneficial to do ahead of time um, with the school. Uh, providing a letter from your doctor. Um, if you don't have one, we have we have samples that we can share with you. And we're also going to be providing fact sheets um, that we put together um, after this call and on our website that you can share with your school and the teachers that hopefully will help you set your child up for success as, as they go back into school. And then as, this is a tough one. Um, decide with your child how much information they would like to share with their classmates about their condition. And I know this changes. Um, and this is kind of a moving target and every child's different. Sometimes your children, when they're in kindergarten, first, second grade, they'll share everything. But then by the time they're in middle school, they wish they hadn't shared anything. So I think, uh, you know, it's a real personal journey for each child and each family. But really work with your child to make sure that you're, you're doing what their wishes are. And and not what we, we as parents might feel is the best. 
And then how do we help set the teachers up to help our kids? Um, and really, really tell them, really make sure they hit it home that our kids need regularly scheduled frequent breaks. And I think you need to remember to tell, you, you need to tell them more, more than once. Again, I had a situation last year where I went through all of these steps that I just shared and then Anna asked to use the bathroom and her math teacher told her that it wasn't her time for a bathroom pass. And, you know, a wet skirt and tears later, you know, she'd had an accident that could have been avoided. He'd been told, but I think our teachers need to be told more than once over and over. And I think we need to really make sure that they're hearing it and the, and the, and the school administrators are hearing it. And if there's a way that our kids can, you know, discreetly remind the teachers, I'm allowed to leave, I'm allowed to go. Um, planning ahead for field trips is another one. I think our kids don't always want us to be the, um, the one that's the chaperone on the field trip, give them a little bit of freedom, but help them um, plan ahead, maybe with the backpack, um, giving, this, giving any supplies to the teachers, making sure you've set, looked at the field trip schedule and making sure ahead of time that they um, have it planned out so that they can um, use the bathroom if they need. Again, the appropriate bathroom space is, a, is imperative. And at different levels, that's going to be um, a different space. Small, sometimes elementary schools have the, the toilets right in the classroom. Sometimes they're down the hall. Some families, are the, the kids are using the teachers. Um, so I think, you know, it'd be great to, to be able to do that. But after hearing Dr. Mueller's presentation, it's like, how do we, we have a lot of challenges because in a perfect world, this, this is still hard for us in a perfect world, but what the schools are dealing with, how, how do we navigate that when they're navigating the issues that they're dealing with? Um, it's something that I grapple with that I think we need to come together and still try to make this work. I think again, to plan for accidents um, ahead of time and make sure that our kids are, are set up for success if they need to change um, their clothes while at school so they, they don't have to go home. And really above all, we wanna support our kids' privacy and our dignity, their dignity. We, we want to ensure that our teachers are, are sensitive, um, they're aware, but, but they're also sensitive to what our kids are going through and just make sure that they treat them with the dignity and respect and help them develop a plan to respond to questions if um, they come up from other teachers or students. And above all, to um, all of us need to be patient and understanding and keep re reassuring our kids and, um, and avoid drawing attention um, to the students as, as they go through their daily, daily school. So I think here is where, you know, us working together and working with doctors like Dr. Miller who are out there um, at a broader level trying to figure out bladder health in the schools, I think we could be a great, um, it could be a great partnership to see how can we all together um, solve this issue. Um, that